Welcome, I welcome you all to this lecture in the course Introduction to Paninian Grammar. In this lecture we are studying the technical terms provided by the Saudhnya Sutras in the text of Ashtadhyayi, the core text of Paninian Grammar. We have studied the concepts of Vakya, Pada and then we are looking at the concepts of Dhatu and Pratipadika. We studied the Saudhnya Sutras which explain the concepts of Dhatu to us. Today we shall devote time to study the Saudhnya Sutras which explain the concept of Pratipadika to us. There are two definitions of Pratipadika given in two sutras. This is the first one. Arthavat Adhatur Apratyaya Pratipadikam 1.2.45 What this means is that a word form which is meaningful Arthavat and which is not a verbal root Dhatu and neither a suffix Pratyaya nor a word ending in the Pratyaya is termed a Pratipadika. I repeat a word form which is meaningful Arthavat and which is not verbal root dhatu, a dhatu, and neither a suffix a pratyayaha nor a word ending in the pratyaya a pratyayaha. This is termed as pratipadika. So pratipadikam is the saudnya, arthavat adhatu a pratyayaha is the saudni. These are the qualifications of the saudni, which is a shabda roop. What this sutra eventually states is that the underived word forms which do not have a pratyaya at the end they are to be termed as pratipadika. If we observe this definition we note that this definition eliminates certain items to be called pratipadika. So this is in the form of negation of basic elements. What it says is no dhatus, no pratyayas but the meaningful units they are to be termed as Pratipadika. That is what this definition seems to say. According to one view in the tradition, all non-verbal root, that is all non-dhatu words in the language, they are derived from the verbal root dhatu. And such words are called vyutpanna. Even in this view, there are a few words which are otherwise called indeclinables, avyayas, at least, which are not derivable and which come under the scope of this definition. According to another view, not all, but some non-verbal root words, non-dhatu words are derived from the verbal root dhatu. Some which are not derived in this manner, which are called avyakpanna, they become the scope of this definition. For example, ditha davitha, they are not derived from any verbal root. Krishna, not derived from any verbal root. Some Scholars would derive it from some verbal roots, but some scholars would not. So this is vyutpanna as well as avyutpanna. So if it is avyutpanna, this becomes part of this definition, scope of this definition. And also ch, va, tu and he, which are indeclinable, they can become scope of this particular definition. Arthavat adhatura pratyaya pratipadikam. Now let us look at the second definition. This definition is given in the second sutra 1246. What this means is that and also the words ending in krit and taddhita suffixes as well as compound are termed as pratipadika. I repeat and also cha the words ending in krit and taddhita suffixes krit taddhita as well as a compound samasa they are also termed as pratipadika. If we study this closely, we note that it is 1246 which negates the term Pratipadika for the words that end in a suffix. 1246 provides with two exceptions in case of such words 
which end in a suffix. Those words which end in either a krit or a taddhita suffix, they are the two exceptions which can still be called a pratipadika. Now what is a krit and what is a taddhita? Let us study this now. These are also the technical terms, saudhnyas, defined by Panini in his sutras. Let us first study what is a krit which is a part of a Pratipadika. So, Krit is defined by 3193, which is a Saudhnya Sutra as Kritatim, very simple sutra. What this means is that Dhatoho Ating Pratyayaha Krit Bhavati, a suffix added immediately after a verbal root, that is a Dhatu, and which is not a thing, is termed Krit. Dhatoho Ating Pratyayaha Krit Bhavati. And I repeat, a suffix added immediately after a verbal root, that is a dhatu, and which is not a thing, is termed krit. The word form thus derived is termed pratipadika by 1246. Krit suffixes generally denote bhava and karakas, six karakas, karta, karma, karana, sampradana, apadana, and adhikarana and we shall be dealing with these concepts in a while. So the kridanta words, by kridanta we mean krit anta that means at the end of which appear a krit, these words are primarily adjectives unless specified otherwise to mean some noun or something. Here are some examples of the krit suffixes. Kritya is a big set of suffixes including ya, tavya and aniya in the section that begins with 3195 and goes up to 31132. Then trich which is stated in 31133 is there. Then trun is another example stated in 32134. An is stated in 321. Ghai is stated in 3318. Tumun is stated in 33178 and Ktwa is stated by 3, 4, 26. These are some examples of Krit suffixes. The Kritya suffixes Yatavya and Aniya, they denote Karma and Bhava generally. Trich and Trun, they denote Karta always. An denotes Karta, Ghai denotes Bhava mainly, Tumun denotes Bhava and Ktwa also denotes Bhava. Here is an example of krit suffixes being added to a verbal root and how the pratipadika is generated. So here we have the verbal root kru to which is added the suffix trich and here we add the suffix trun and then by this derivation process we, we delete ch over here and na over here. First of all it is termed as a marker or it and we have studied these sutras by 133 and then this ch and na are deleted by 139. Then by applying 7384, kru becomes kar and we get the forms kartru and kartru again. The difference is however in accent. In this case where truch is added, the final vowel is accented, kartru. And where trun is added, the initial vowel is accented. That's the difference. And we shall study this difference of accent later on in this course and in an advanced course, the advanced theories on accent. This is how Krit suffix generates the Pratipadika. Now let us look at the second suffix mentioned in 1246, Taddhita. What is a Taddhita? A Taddhita suffix is added after a Pratipadika to which a sup is already added. So we have this formula, pratipadika plus sup, to which is added a taddhita suffix. This gives rise to a pratipadika. This generates a pratipadika as an output. For example, if one wants to express the meaning descendant of dasharatha, then we have dasharatha, which is a pratipadika, to which is added the suffix as, which is a sup, and we add the suffix iya, which is a taddhita after it and this us gets deleted and so we get the form dasharathi as an output 
this is a pratipadika by 1 to 46. Dasharathi is an adjective and dasharatha from which it was derived is a noun. So the taddhita suffixes we note in most of the cases change the parts of speech of the given word. These taddhita suffixes are stated in the section from 4176 up to 54160. The sutra is taddhitaha 4176. So we note that this is once again an enumerative definition. All the suffixes that come in between 4176 and 54160, 54160 including they are all called taddhita. There are more than 1000 sutras in this section and the suffixes stated therein they all are called taddhitas. So this can be termed as a lexicon within a lexicon and the arrangement of this big section is quite peculiar and very very complex. Here are some examples of the meanings which get expressed by suffixes in this taddhita section. Descendant of by the sutra tasyabatyam colored by dai tenaraktam ragat one who knows taddhite tadveda born there tatra bhavaha modification of that tasya vikaraha its state tasya bhavastvatalau Completion of that, tasya purane dati, measurement of, yatta dete bhya parimane vatup, possession of, tadastyasmin niti matup. Superlative degree, atishayane tamabishthanau, comparative degree, dvivachana vibhajyopapade tarabiyasunau. So these are the taddhita suffixes and the output of these taddhita suffixes is a pratipadika like dasharathi. So this is how krit and taddhita are defined in ashtadhyayi and they are defined as pratipadikas. Now let us look at the third word in the sutra 1246 namely samasa. This is also a technical term defined in the ashtadhyayi in the following manner. What samasa stands for is a compound stated in the sutra of 213 prak kadarat samasaha. What this means is the process or the words stated from 213 up to 2238 in which the word kadara occurs are termed as samasa. The term samasa is thus once again an enumerative definition. All the words, all the processes stated in the section beginning with 213 up to 2238, they are all called, all are enumerated as samasa. The word samasa is derived from the verbal root asa with the preverb or upasarga sam added to it and the suffix a added to it. What this means is words thrown out together. This is derived from the verbal root asu kshepane, asa, which means to throw. What it eventually means is that words which are otherwise thrown out of mouth as separate, as independent, are thrown out together as one unit. And that unit is called samasa or a compound. Let us look at this term closely. Samartha words in the sentence form the base for the process of compounding to start with. Samartha means fit to convey the same meaning. So if you have a sentence like Rajnya Purusha Gachati meaning the man of a king goes. In this we notice that man of a king is a peculiar phrase in which man is linked with the king as the servant of the king. So there is a relation of Svaswami Bhava in this particular sentence between man and a king. King is the Swami, man is the Swa, the servant. So now man and king, they are fit to become the input of the process of compounding. And the derived word form 
would denote the same linked meanings. So we have Radhnya Purushaha to begin with and from that we go to Rajan plus us and Purusha plus Su, we delete us and Su and then we have Rajan plus Purusha, then Na gets deleted and we have Raja plus Purusha and then we have Raja Purusha. And this word Raja Purusha conveys the same meaning as the words Radhnya Purushaha. So if we use the words Radhnya Purusha Gachati in a sentence, they would convey the same meanings when Raja Purusha Gachati is used. In this way, Raja Purusha is Samartha, is capable of expressing the same meanings as, as Radhnya Purushaha, also interlinked. Same meaning is conveyed in the sentence by these two words and in the compound by one word. So in the compound what happens is both meanings become one, two meanings become one. Here are some sections within the Ashtadhyayi which deal with the topic of compound or samasa. So for example, in 2.1 and 2 compound prescription is stated. In 2.2, word order in the compounds is described. In 2.4, gender and number in the compound is stated. In 3.2, Upapada Tatpurusha compound is stated. In 5.4, Samasanta suffixes are stated. In 3.2, Upapada Tatpurusha compounds are stated meaning the suffixes which form the Upapada Tatpurusha compound, they are stated. Upapada Tatpurusha compound is prescribed in 2.2 by the Sutra Upapada Mating. Coming back to 5.4, Samasanta suffixes, the suffixes which come, which are added at the end of a compound are stated. They are part of the Taddita suffixes. In 6.2, the compound accent is stated in detail. In 6.3, operations on the first member of the compound are stated. Apart from these sections, there are some other sections in which compound is treated for various operations like retroflex in 8.3 and 8.4. There are three features which are described in the Paninian grammatical traditions, the features of a compound. They are Aikarthya, Aikapadya and Aikasvariya. Aikarthya means one meaning, Aikapadya means one word and Aikasvarya means one accent. These three are the features of one unit called a compound or a samasa. So two units in the form of meaning and words and accents, they become one unit with one meaning and one word and one accent. So for example, Raja Sambandhi Purusha. This is the meaning which becomes one as a word Raja Purusha and you get one accent as far as Raja Purusha compound is concerned. There are four main types of compounds described here, Avyayi Bhava, Tat Purusha, Bahuvrihi and Dvandva. The two examples of Avyayi Bhava compound are Pratitina and Yathashakti. And these two become Pratipadika to which Sup is added. Tatpurusha, the examples of Tatpurusha are Kumbhakara and Nakabhinna. They become Pratipadika. The two examples of Bahuvrihi are Lambodara and Ekadanta and they become a Pratipadika. Two examples of Dvandva are Ramalakshmana and Hastapada and they become a Pratipadika. Meaning wise, the compounds are stated in this particular fashion. So Avyayi Bhava is stated to be Prayana Purva Pada Padartha Pradhana. Mostly the meaning of the first word, first Pada is the main in Avyayi Bhava compound. In a Tatpurusha compound, mainly the meaning of the last element is the main, prayana uttara padartha pradhana. In a bahuvrihi compound, it is mainly the 
meaning of the other word not stated as constituent of the compound is the main prayana anya padartha pradhana and in a dvandva compound prayana ubhaya padartha pradhana that means that both the words act as the pradhana the meaning of the of both the words acts as pradhana as far as dvandva compound is concerned prayana ubhaya padartha pradhana this is how samasa is treated in the ashtadhyayi we have treated the concept of samasa in brief we have tried to understand the saudhnya sutra which describes samasa all this comes to the basic point that the samasa is termed as pratipadika by 1246 krit taddhita samasascha so the words that end in the krit suffix the words that end in the taddhita suffix and the samasas they all are called pratipadikas so what is not a pratipadika it is interesting to know what is not a pratipadika so the forms which express the feminine gender they are not a pratipadika a suffix is added after a pratipadika to express femininity in general here is an example we have a pratipadika aj which means a goat to which is added a feminine suffix a which gives us an output aja similarly we have the pratipadika gaura which means fair or white to which is added the feminine suffix e which then gives us an output gauri so what is the status of these words aja and gauri are they pratipadikas no why because they are formed by adding a suffix and therefore 1245 cannot term them pratipadika because 1245 says arthavat adhatuhu apratyayah a meaningful word element which is not adhatu and which is not ending in a pratyaya is called pratipadika these two words are ending in a pratyaya and therefore they cannot be termed pratipadika by 1245 now in 1246 two examples were given of the words which end in a pratyaya as an exception to 1245 and those words are also called pratipadika and they are krit and taddhit now these suffixes a and e expressing the feminine gender they are not part of the krit suffix nor part of the taddhit suffix and therefore they cannot be termed pratipadika by 1246 either they are just left as they are aja is neither a pratipadika nor anything else it is a word expressing feminine gender to which is added a sup and this is made a pad which is eligible to be used in a sentence that's all this is not a pratipadika what is the function of a pratipadika addition of a sub is an important function of a pratipadika so we take kartru a kridanta word to which we add the suffix sub and we get the pad karta we take dasharathi a taddhita word a taddhita pratipadika and we add the suffix sub to it and we get the pad dasharathi similarly we take rajapurusha a samasa and we add the suffix sub to it and we get the form raja purusha which is a subanta similarly we add a feminine suffix to a pratipadika so if we take kartru which is a word which is a kridanta pratipadika we add the feminine suffix e to it and we get the form kartri which is once again not a pratipadika but kartri expresses the feminine gender these are the two important functions of a pratipadika to summarize the technical terms in the paninian grammar reflect the structure of paninian grammar dhatu and pratipadika are the basic building blocks also noted as the linguistic atoms these represent the lexicon of sanskrit language this lexicon is both 
derived as well as underived. The derived lexicon is interlinked with the internal lexical items and the derivation of such a lexicon is theoretically at least infinite. This lexicon is static as well as dynamic. It also reflects the productive capacity of Paninian grammar. This capacity to produce such n number of sequences is the strength of Paninian grammar. Using this capacity, modern Indian languages derive vocabulary to express newly arrived and arriving meanings. These conclusions that we have drawn, they are similar to what we also drew earlier. This similarity is the highlight of the analysis. The roots, the technical terms Dhatu and Pratipadika, they are the backbone of this derivation system of Paninian grammar. And so, the effective use of these two technical terms smoothens the derivation process on the part of the grammarian Panini. This is what is to be highlighted by this similarity in the conclusions. Now we shall study some more Saudhnya Sutras in the coming lectures, notably the Karakas and some other technical terms which are called Kritrima technical terms artificial technical terms. But before going there and before closing today's lecture, let us follow our practice and recite one more Mangala Charana. This is taken from a commentary called Vishamapada Vyakya composed by Nagesha Bhatta 18th century CE and the Mangala Charana reads like this. Pitaram Vakratundasya Vande Shadavatra Janmadam Karomi Kaustubhav Vyakhyam Iha Sankhyavatam Mude. I repeat, Pitaram Bakratundasya Vande Shadavatra Janmadam Karomi Kaustubhav Vyakhyam Iha Sankhyavatam Mude. And the five sutras of today are taken from 631 up to 635, and they are Aluguttarapade, Panchamyas Tokadibhya. Ojas Sahombhas Tamasas Truti Yayaha Manasas Saudnyayam and Adnya Yinicha. I repeat Aluguttarapade Panchamyas Tokadibhyaha Ojas Sahombhas Tamasas Truti Yayaha Manasas Saudnyayam and Adnya Yinicha. Thank you for your attention.